These are the seven final villains to defeat in One Piece, starting with Fleet Admiral Sakazuki. So as an antagonist, Sakazuki has one of the most impressive CVs of transgressions against our main characters as anyone could in all of media. To name two major highlights, he was of course directly responsible for killing Luffy's brother, Podgasty Ace, and he was a very active and enthusiastic participant in the genocide of Ohara, the home island of straw hat archeologist, Nico Robin. In terms of raw power, Sakazuki may be the single greatest obstacle standing in Luffy's way of becoming the Pirate King. He possesses a uniquely nasty Logia type devil fruit that allows Sakazuki to conjure, manipulate, and become magma, which the author of One Piece, Ed Shiro Oda, has stated has the highest defensive capabilities amongst all devil fruits, not just the Logia class, all devil fruits. The world of One Piece is so large and varied that there exists a tier of characters who may as well be gods. The kind of people that if you encounter them, the only option is to run. Sakazuki is one of these people, which has been proven on multiple occasions, but most notably when even Blackbeard told his entire crew to flee upon discovering that Sakazuki was approaching their location. And to demonstrate exactly why it is that people choose to run, on one occasion, Whitebeard, an emperor of the sea, and another one of these godlike figures who you have no choice but to run from, decided to clash with Sakazuki, and he got a chunk of his head blown off for his efforts. Recently, Sakazuki also blew off a piece of Bartholomew Kuma's head, but that appears to have been retconned. But what makes Sakazuki an order of magnitude more dangerous dangerous than most antagonists has nothing to do with raw power. It's all about how deeply he believes in his philosophy of change for the world. Sakazuki is the figurehead of the absolute justice belief, with a specific sub-focus in thorough justice, meaning that he believes evil will never be eradicated from the world unless you destroy it at the root. It's gotten so extreme that Sakazuki now believes that certain people are born innately evil. For example, if you're the son of a pirate, then ugh, you're evil, because you inherited the evil gene from your evil parents, which means that Sakazuki Suzuki takes no issue murdering children who haven't technically committed a crime yet, and in fact, killing them is the preferred outcome because it's getting rid of evil before it has the chance to commit said crime. It's a terrifying mindset, made all the more horrific by the fact that he is currently in charge of the world's largest military force. As Fleet Admiral of the Marines, Sakazuki is a global tragedy waiting to happen and a prime contender for one of perhaps even the final villain of One Piece. And at the very least, he isn't someone who's going down until the very final arc. And working directly under Sakazuki is Marine Admiral Ryokugyu, known for the sake of ease as Green Bull, because Ryokugyu can be a bit of a tongue twister. But Green Bull is a fairly late game Admiral who was drafted into the Marines during the two year time skip. And I have no idea where they stumbled upon this dude, but the world government found themselves some solid antagonistic gold here. He's the wielder of another unique type Logia fruit that allows him to conjure, manipulate, and become forests, which is quite troubling because even if you do manage to destroy his body, Green Bull can just grow himself another from any given seed or sapling within this forest, which sounds quite lovely and nature positive. And it's quite twisted really, because every time Green Bull fights, he leaves this beautiful forest in his wake. But of all of the Marine Admirals, I think he's the one I would least want to run into in a dark alley. Because Green Bull is also a follower of the Absolute Justice Movement, which is actually very popular within the Marines right now. And while it's often attributed as the philosophy of Fleet Admiral Sakazuki, it was actually first mentioned all the way back in chapter 96 by Vice Admiral John giant, and it seems like it's an older philosophy, particularly since there are different denominations of absolute justice. Green Bull, for example, practices a subclass known as determined justice, which if I had to describe it, would be an even more trigger happy iteration of absolute justice. In the case of most absolute justice followers, they believe that the end justifies the means. They're not necessarily thrilled to carry out the means, but they're always seeking that end. Whereas Green Bull's justice is more about seeking the means, hoping that it maybe somehow will result in an end. He actively believes in the pursuit of subjugation and the systematic imbalance of the world, catering his activities towards facilitating acts of violence and discrimination with the belief that these acts will lead to justice in a manner best described as somehow, which I think is best epitomized in the mantra that he reveals on Wano. Discrimination creates solace, a lovely inspirational quote put on your wall in your workplace. But Green Bull has another quote because that was stated shortly after he yelled, you have no human rights. Don't blame me for it, it's how the world works. TLDR, Green Bull is a man without a plan. 
He's trying to emulate absolute justice without understanding how it actually functions or what it's actually trying to do. He has no intellectual curiosity and he's more of a justice zealot operating on blind belief, which makes Green Bull quite unhinged and significantly more dangerous, especially in the position of a Marine Admiral because he holds no logical consistency. He doesn't understand the outcomes of his actions, but he still seeks further actions to do. Much like Sakazuki, the most dangerous thing about Green Bull isn't his raw physicality, but it's this belief, this strange questionable belief, which unfortunately when you boil it down is a belief in the status quo, meaning that Green Bull will fight with everything he has to maintain the power of the world government, which means that he's going to be a very difficult challenge to overcome in the future. But one of the best things about the One Piece world is that it's a living and breathing world, which means that once beaten villains don't just up and disappear. No, they endure and there's one particular group of villains who have come back right at the climax of the series, forming something of a coalition to take one last shot to that sweet, sweet Pirate King dream. And this would be the organization of Cross Guild, featuring six members who have been defeated directly by Luffy, being Alveda, Moji, Richie, Galdino, also known as Mr. Three, the former head of Baroque Works, a Crocodile, and of course, the almighty figurehead of Cross Guild and Emperor of the Sea, Buggy the Clown. It also features two members who have been defeated directly by Zoro, being Kabaji and Dove's Bones, aka Mr. One. But going in its favor, we have one member who has actually beaten Zoro, being the world's greatest swordsman, Dracul Mihawk. So a more accurate name for this group would be the United Federation of Losers featuring Drake Your Mihawk. And that last member there is the biggest reason why we're taking Cross Guild seriously in a video like this. There are very few things guaranteed to happen in One Piece, but Zoro will eventually need to fight and defeat Mihawk to claim the title of world's greatest swordsman. Meanwhile, Luffy will need to contend with Buggy, who is now also gunning for the ambition of becoming the Pirate King. And before we rule out Cross Guilds as very serious candidates in this race, let's Let's just consider this. If you add up the bounties of every wanted pirate in Cross Guild, the organization totals 8 billion 848 million berries, which is the highest confirmed crew bounty of any remaining emperor faction. Straw hat pirates, blackbeard pirates, red hair pirates, none of them even come close. At the time of this recording anyway, that can and probably will change. But for now, we are taking Cross Guild very, very seriously. But not as seriously as this next final antagonist, a man who has been lurking in the shadows for more than 25 years of publication time, Figgeland Garling. So we've only very recently been introduced introduced to the existence that is Figgle and Garling. And when it comes to introductions in One Piece, Oda tends to have a very standard method. If a character is particularly important, then they get a fun little standard text box detailing their name, occupation, and maybe bounty, if they're a criminal that is. But with Figgle and Garling, he is particularly special and he got an entire page of exposition. In the present day in Sacred Marijois, a single celestial dragon had just been executed. The man who passed the sentence was a dominating figure who once distinguished himself at a place called God Valley. Today, he is the supreme commander of the Holy Knights. His name is Saint Figgeland Garling. So the Holy Knights are one of three private militia who serve the world nobles directly. The most basic would be the private guards, entire squads of which are trained and assigned to each individual world noble. The second would be Cypherpol Zero, who are a private espionage and assassination group containing some incredibly powerful individuals. However, even then, the Holy Knights are on a completely different level and only called upon to deal with the most serious of matters. To give you an example, of just how serious one of these situations needs to be to call upon them, the Holy Knights have never been officially mobilized even a single time in all of One Piece to date. Whether it be the Paramount War, the alliance between Big Mom and Kaido, or even the recent Egghead Island incident, the world government has yet to view deploying the Holy Knights as necessary. And despite the fact that there are so few of them, Monkey D. Dragon considers them powerful enough to challenge his entire revolutionary army, with no clear answer on who would emerge victorious. And standing right at the apex Apex of this already apex is Figgeland Garling. With Garling's role as Supreme Commander suggesting that he has a higher degree of power and authority than even Fleet Admiral Sakazuki. In fact, politically, Garling has far more authority than Sakazuki because he's entrusted to deal with matters involving world nobles. Whereas all that Sakazuki can do is beg before their feet as they demand more and more lobster meals that one time. But Garling is particularly terrifying because he harbors all of the horrendous 
beliefs and grotesque entitlements of a world noble. However, unlike the vast majority of those useless lumps of meat that are populating Marijuana, Garling has the power to back it up. In fact, Garling is significantly more ruthless than your average world noble. From what we've seen thus far, he doesn't really enjoy the standard world noble activity of toying with and humiliating his victims. However, a lot of that may actually be because Garling is so scarily efficient and almost clinical in diagnosing the most painful and appropriate method of ending someone's life. Along with the surgical skills as one of the world's greatest swordsmen to implement a cruel and unusual death upon anyone unfortunate enough to cross paths with him, which was demonstrated when we saw him participate in the God Valley hunt. Garling was so efficiently bloodthirsty that he'd already murdered a whole cohort of innocent victims before the hunt even began. And for this transgression, Garling was punished with a 10,000 point penalty. Although once the hunt began, Garling was able to gather 100,000 points with ease, which for the mathematically inclined is a net profit of 90,000 points. We should also talk about Garling's funky aesthetics because it's not just a quirky fashion choice. Garling's hair and beard combination creates a moon. And the first thing to know about One Piece is that sun and moon symbology is everywhere and very, very important. Because we also have another moon-based faction in One Piece being the Kozuki clan who were loyal to Joy Boy and likely the Ancient Kingdom. The Kozuki clan were the moon to Joy Boy's son. They were his vassals. With Figaland, Garling and the Holy Knight seeming to represent the moon vassal of the world government. Which means that Garling is both metaphorically and literally standing directly in the way of the dawn of the world prophecy, which will likely never come to fruition so long as he remains breathing. But even then, Garling, he is a mere mini boss compared to everyone else we have left. Sitting at the very top of the political hierarchy of the five elder stars, Saint J. Garcia Saturn, warrior god of science and defense, Saint Marcus Mars, warrior god of the environment, Saint Topman Wokuri, warrior god of justice, Saint Ethan Baron V. Nasturo, warrior god of finance, and Saint Shepherd Jupiter, warrior god of agriculture. Each of whom individually hold more influence over the planets than any faction and collectively are charged with maintaining a well-calculated stranglehold of power, which has lasted for the past nine centuries. Although we don't know if the five elders have been the same people that whole time, but it's not out of the question. Methods of achieving immortality and perpetual youth do exist in One Piece. But what's more troubling is that each of the five elders appears to possess a range of demonic powers. Saint Saturn, for example, can transform into a spider yokai-like creature with the ability to freeze people, explode their heads, and near limitless regeneration capabilities in the odd circumstance in which he does incur injury. So because it's One Piece, it's highly likely that this is a devil fruit, perhaps some sort of fancy mythical Zoan. But at the time of this recording, that has yet to be confirmed. He could just flat out be a demon. Whatever it is, it's not unique to Saturn, and each of the five elders have their own demonic abilities, which in combination with their truly fearsome intelligence, allow these five people to rule the vast majority of the world. And whilst the five elders are technically world nobles, I do think that demon is a more appropriate classification, because their desires and depravity trump that of even the most sickening of regular world nobles. They're a living, breathing incarnation of hell on earth that must be eradicated at all costs, but that is significantly easier said than done. And even if you do get rid of them, what goes on to fill that void may be even worse. And a prime candidate for said void fillage would be Emperor of the Sea Marshal D. Teach, better known as Blackbeard. Now don't be fooled by his charming white sort of condom hat that he wore that one time. This man is terror and anarchy incarnate. Blackbeard is the challenge that Oda has been building up throughout all of One Piece. He follows a parallel journey to Luffy, both rising to prominence at around the same time, and now the two leading candidates to become the next Pirate King. But the most intimidating thing about Blackbeard is that he represents the unknown. Almost everything that Blackbeard's done has taken place off screen. The level six incident, the payback war, the Rocky Port incident, all of these world shaking events that he was responsible for, and we know next to nothing about them or him. And what little we do see of Blackbeard only raises more questions to add to the rotund vat of unknown that he is. What we do know is that right now, he's the only character capable of wielding two devil fruits. We don't know how or why. We also know that he's allegedly never slept in his life. Again, we don't know how or why, but most intriguingly of all, Marshall D. Teach is of course a member of the D-Clan. In fact, he's only one of two D-Clan members we know of who's been described as flat out evil, with the other being the allegedly past Rocks D. Zebek. Whereas every other member of the Will of D works in their own ways to better the world, Marshall D. Teach and Rocks D. Zebek seem to have a very different twisted vision of the world, and Blackbeard has almost certainly inherited the will of Rocks in this regard. Which means that Blackbeard is going to be a very personal opponent for Luffy, because this is set to be the conclusion of a millennia long civil war within the D-Clan. And it makes the final conflict 
very complicated. Because Blackbeard is no ally of the world government either. In fact, his bounty poster was found ripped up in the Chamber of Flowers on Marajoie, alongside Luffy's, and the entity responsible for this is the figure currently set up to be the true final boss of One Piece, Saint Emu Nerona. Emu is an enigma amongst enigmas. If you gathered all of the enigmas in a single room, they'd all point to Emu and go, that, that dude's properly mysterious. There's a concept in One Piece known as the Empty Throne, which is the very foundation of the world government. During the Great War of the Void Century, 20 kingdoms came together and pledged their allegiance to an organization that would have no single leader, with the Empty Throne serving as that symbolism. The idea being to uphold the values of equality. No kingdom, no country, and most importantly, no individual was to be considered more important than another. At least not within the world government itself. Outside of the world government, <laughs> go crazy. But all of this was a facade anyway, because from its founding 800 years ago to this very day, a single entity has occupied the empty throne and has had sole discretion over every world government decision made between then and now. To the point where even the five elders exist as mere middlemen to carry out Emu's commands. And I'm sure you've all heard this quote before, but I think it's especially appropriate here. The greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing the world that he never existed. And that is exactly what Emu's done. And not only that, but Emu continues to employ this trick to this very day, which was seen most recently when Emu destroyed the Lelucia kingdom, claiming that it never existed. After which point, all record of Lelucia was erased, and even those who do remember the kingdom will never speak out about it in the fear that they will be erased as well. Saint Emu Nerona is the single most powerful individual in One Piece. Emu is the secret final boss who appears out of nowhere once you think the game is over, and the ultimate challenge to overcome in the One Piece world. Meanwhile, your ultimate challenge is much easier, which is to subscribe to this channel for consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your YouTube feed.